Hey, everybody. Um, give us about one minute and we will let folks slow, uh, once the slow trickle starts to uh, come to a about a halt, we will get started. Awesome, 52 attendees right off the bat. Ooh. Great interest and excitement. Yeah. We got a few more coming in. So 30 seconds or so, everybody. Get seated, get your last sip of water. This is recorded. So if you have a colleague that misses it or you have to jump, which I highly encourage you to not uh, have to jump. Hopefully you're enjoying your lunch. Um, we'll get started shortly. Right. I think we're at critical mass. We've got a great show. Welcome, everybody. I'm David Valancourt, CEO and founder of the GMP Collective. Really excited to have you guys have everybody join us today um, for the 21st episode of When Things Go Wrong, 21 consecutive months and running. I want to start off with a couple of housekeeping items before I turn it over to Bethany. First, um, there were some great questions received during the registration process, but if during the conversation, any uh, inspiring questions come to mind, throw them in the Q&A. We've got the Q&A feature there. You can ask them as yourself, you can ask them anonymously, and we'll do our best to answer them during this workshop, this webinar. This is for you guys, the audience. This is all about education and value. So take your burning questions. We've got some great expert panelists in the hot seat here and throw the questions out there. Uh, as I mentioned, for folks that were uh, joining a, a couple of moments ago, this is recorded and will be available on our website and our YouTube channel, as is all the previous 20 episodes. So be sure to share it around with anybody that may have missed it. And we will also be sending out an email with the highlights in the next couple of days after this webinar ends. So Without further ado, oh, final thing, we are gonna stick to a strict one hour. I know everybody's time is valuable, so we will start wrapping things up about five to three minutes beforehand with the final question so that everybody can get back on with their day. And with that, Bethany, I hand it over to you, ma'am. Thank you, David, and thanks everyone for joining us for this episode on ensuring integrity. I'm happy to be your moderator of When Things Go Wrong, where we discuss various challenges and issues within the cannabis industry with the aim of offering valuable insights, tips, and solutions. I'm the Director of Content Strategy and Market Growth here at the GMP Collective, and I'm excited to continue working with experts in the cannabis and hemp industry. Feel free to contact us to learn more about our services, including technical and strategic advising, client referral program, and webinar sponsorship opportunities. Plus, I have to mention briefly, the ASTM USP workshop is happening in Philadelphia on June 10th. It is free for ASTM members or $115 for the public, but that's the same cost as a year-long membership with ASTM, so we encourage you to join. Please join us in Philadelphia. It's right around the corner. All right, without further ado, we're getting started. You all know David Valancourt, CEO of the GMP Collective and co-founder of S3 Collective, as well as vice chair of ASTM International Committee D37 on Cannabis. Joining us today for this episode, we have three really great guests. I'll, let me start with Yasha Khan. He is co-founder of MCR Labs. He leads the organization's data and brand initiatives with more than a decade of expertise in cannabis testing, Yasha ensures MCR's status as one of the industry's most trusted cannabis testing laboratories. His current focus is on policy and data science with an emphasis on data-informed approaches to regulating laboratories and protecting consumers nationwide. Welcome today, Yasha. <clears throat> Next is Nicole Barber. Nicole is a seasoned scientist and executive professional with a background in a wide range 
of scientific fields and various industries. She currently consults for the cannabis industry in both laboratory and cultivation settings. Previous to her current role, she was the chief scientific officer for the highest volume analytical cannabis lab in the state of Nevada. She successfully led multiple laboratories and research initiatives that led to publications in academic journals and revamped multiple operations to meet regulatory demands within ISO, CGMP, SQF, HACCP, PCQI, which she carries certification for each. And also joining us, Brian Radke, former, former owner of Green Dragon Colorado. He also operated a cannabis grow and currently operates a decontamination company called My Virgin Mary. He also, also offers consulting services to the cannabis industry. Welcome everyone. What a great group we have today. Uh, let's kick things off by understanding what lab shopping practices are. Let's explain what it is and how it became prevalent in the industry. Uh, Yasha, would you like to kick us off with this? I would, thank you. Um, I actually made some slides and I'm gonna share my screen. Excellent. I'll be quick, it's about three minutes. Perfect. Okay, um, so many cannabis consumers choose flowers based on the amount of THC those flowers contain. And they ask producers or they ask for products at the stores uh, with the highest THC levels. Shop owners wanting to meet consumer demands pressure cultivators for the highest testing flowers. And this demand puts cultivators in a bind as they struggle to sell lower testing flowers. Um, as a result, some cultivators pressure labs to provide higher potency results. If a lab refuses, the cultivator will take their business to another lab. This practice known as lab shopping undermines the integrity of the uh, testing process and the entire market. Since we have access to a whole lot of data, we can see what this looks like um, in, in reality. This is real data from real labs. Uh, so this is a single cultivator and all of their THC tests throughout 2022. Uh, they used two labs, one lab in blue and one lab in orange, and they switched labs at some point in April. The moment they switched labs is the moment that their uh, THC increased by 28%. It was sudden. It was exactly at the same time as they switched labs. And of course, you can say they could have changed something in their cultivation, but we can take a look at um, every cultivator that switches to such a lab and every cultivator that's, that made the switch, uh, they had a tremendous increase in potency. This is consistent. And for potency, this is a problem. It's a consumer protection violation if they're getting inaccurate results. Uh, but it's also a health risk because the same thing is happening. Oh, sorry. The reason why, I, I skipped a couple uh, slides. The reason why labs are doing this is because they can make more money. Labs that offer higher potency, they um, increase in market share relatively rapidly. And this happens year after year. And this is in Massachusetts, uh, annualized $6 million that they increase in market share. Uh, and with safety screens, we see the same thing. Um, a cultivator, the moment that they switch labs is the moment they never fail again. And here we have a um, cultivator and all of their total yeast and mold tests throughout a year. On the left, they're, they're testing with one lab and then they switch labs at some point. And that's the moment at which they switch from having a 14% failure rate to never failing again. And this happens not only to this one cultivator, but to every cultivator that switches to this lab. Each line here represents an individual cultivator. On the left is their failure rate at their previous lab, and on the right is their failure rate at this lab that they moved to. Mm. So the, the benefit of switching to such a lab is obvious, I think. And um, 
the reason for doing so is it's a competitive advantage. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Nikki, uh, please feel free to jump in and add your perspective on the definition here of lab shopping. Yeah, Yasha covered it pretty good. I mean, that is exactly what it is when a uh, cultivator is unhappy with the results, whether it comes to the microbial testing or the potency testing or sometimes even terpenes. Um, when they're unhappy, they often will switch labs and see things as what Yasha showed very clearly on those graphs, you can, you can see the trends, certain labs will produce certain results that are more favorable, and they tend to get more clientele. But you know, I think it is starting to shift, thankfully, where people are looking more for consistency uh, in the data, which is what we want, you know, people can see real results when there's consistent data and not, I mean, it's unreasonable to think you're going to pass microbials all the time. So obviously, as soon as you see a 0% failure rate, that's a red flag. Got it. Excellent. Brian, would you like to add your thoughts and perspective on the definition here of lab shopping and why it happens? Yeah, on on the side of a as of a grower, um, Yasha, I mean that the it, it hit I mean, you just hit the nail on the head as hard as you could with the sledgehammer. Um I mean, I, I'm sitting here, I'm watching it, and you know, I just it, it's there's a lab that was in Colorado. We're not going to name names. It went out of business a little over two years ago. And everybody knew if you went to that lab, you were getting anywhere from, you know, 20%, oh, but then you go there, you're getting 28%. I mean, I, I hit, I hit 36 and a half percent from that lab on certain, on certain genetics, um, which, you know, shouldn't really be happening. And then I would take that exact same genetic to another lab and I would hit 20%. Um, and, as for a cultivator, it's everything. If you if you fail, and even you know, depending on how far back we want to go, cannabis starting at three thousand dollars a pound on the retail market, you know, now going for eight hundred dollars a pound, it was easier to swallow a failure when you were at a you know at a at a much higher value um, for cannabis. But now with cannabis being at, you know six, seven, eight hundred dollars a pound, you fail a test or you get a low THC percentage you're done, especially on a failure. If you fail and then either you're going to send it to remediation, hopefully you're going to send it, you know, to a decontamination prior to sending it in for testing. But once you fail, your $800 pound is now worth $400 or you'll just be told no. And you're going to be sending it to remediation for, for, you know, extraction. So, you know, I consistently lab shopped all the time and I would have labs 100% tell me like, don't work with this lab. They're not going to give you the results. Don't do this. And then, you know, oh, I'm going to take my microbial over here. I'm going to take my THC over here. I'm going to take this over there. And it was just a game. It was just running around and running around and running around. And, you know, and it's really hard for labs because labs, they know who's doing it. And they're in the ones that are trying to be like, you know, your statement at the very beginning about being ethical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's a that's a very loose term. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of people that are trying to hold that bar and trying to trying to 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 um, make that happen. But as a grower, you know, when when pounds were over fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars a pound, as a grower, you're like, you know, you're you're willing to take risks, and so whether you know, I know we're going to get further into this later into the meeting about different risks that growers are taking and where and where we take it. But when you have everything on the line, you're going to lab shop to get the highest test results because just like Yasha said, these dispensaries, they're not educated. And that's one of the biggest things that I that we consistently do is educate, educate, educate. Oh, it's oh, I just want something over 20% THC because that's how I'm going to get as high as I possibly can get. That's I mean it's just so far from you know the point, but everybody buys THC, you know, cannabis off the THC potency amount. So you know, as a grower, you know that, oh, I grew this banana punch. And it's only 18 percent. It's just as good as something that's, you know, 25 or 30 percent. But the education is not there. So people don't understand it. Right. And Brian, you've you've been in this industry for nearly 20 years and you've you've seen it all. Uh, and we've been talking a bit about THC inflation. There's also another category like moldy bug infested product, mm -hmm. which has major safety concerns for consumers. Uh, can we touch on that briefly? 
Yeah, I, when when I had Green Dragon, the testing was just starting to come, but it wasn't like mandated. So um, we had no clue. I mean, you know, growing up, you know, a native of Colorado, I remember one of my first trips as a kid was to drive over to Peonia to get some like Peonia purpleizer. And, and, you know, you never thought about that. You never thought about like, oh, you know, microbial loads or, you know, what am I smoking? I just knew I bought it from some old head in, you know, Peonia. And that was like, that was, that was okay. And so as my microbial started coming, that was right when we sold the company. And then, you know, I took a hiatus, started a new company up and um, the very first harvest, man, I would have spilled a plate of spaghetti on the ground and fed it to my grandma and we failed. I think we failed at 11,500. And um, I had no idea what was going on. I, I was just like, this is, you know, this, this, I, I just didn't understand it until I really started talking to some professionals about, okay, what does it mean? You, like, you don't go to Whole Foods and buy organic apple and light it on fire. You're lighting cannabis on fire. And what is, what is it really meaning when you're smoking infested cannabis? I mean, with my company, My Virgin Mary, who does decontamination, um, we've cleaned, I have seen product come through our facility that's 2 million CFU. Like, and we can clean it and we can get it to pass. Do you still want to smoke it? <laughs> I, I, you know, and, right. you know, I'll, I'll give a little plug. We use, we use the rad source technology. Um, and, you know, if the machine is done and, and run right, pretty much you will pass. Every single person will pass, but then there's standards past that, you know, we'll run the product and it goes back to the dispensary. Are, what are they doing with it? How long are they keeping it? How quickly are they sending in the test? Are they putting it back into a cure room that's 90 degrees and 80% humidity and just, and, and reinfecting and re, you know, recross, re not reinfecting, better word to be say is recross contaminating the product again. We see it all the time. Mm -hmm. So just because you use the, just because you use some form of decontamination doesn't necessarily mean that, that the end, that the end consumer, you know, they could take samples really, really quick, send it to the lab as fast as possible, pass. And then the product that's sitting at these facilities is just, you know, these guys take two weeks to clone, two to two to two to four weeks to veg, and then, you know, six to 10 weeks to flower. And then, and then they go to, they go to cure this product and they have no clue what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No we Now, I mean, I'm spending more time educating now, trying to help. Like, of course I have a company that does decontamination, but at this point, people, people are literally just sending their product to us before testing, I mean, probably 95% of all of our clients are just, they send everything to us, which, which, you know, I, I get the bags. I feel the product it's moist. I can feel it's not cured a hundred percent. These guys are just trying to beat time. They're mm -hmm. trying to get the product on the shelves as fast as possible to sell the product. And there is very little concern for the end consumer at the end of the day. Got it. Brian, yeah. I can jump in briefly, you know, the it's clear, right? This is a multifaceted problem across the supply chain. This is not unique to cultivators that have the problem they're stressed out with. Labs are under pressure. Even regulators are under pressure, right? This is a really challenging issue. And the risk tolerance, especially when you consider coming from a legacy marketplace and the culture of the industry where you had to hide, you had to come from a fear-based uh, mindset, and you had to have an appetite for risk to be able to operate and survive in that space. So you get, this is the problem you get, right? This is this is one of those results and it's not an easy solution. And, uh, you know, just to be clear, you know, this is not about the blame game. Um, you know, we're here to just show all the ways that this has gone wrong throughout the industry. And the solution is not simple. Um, if it was simple, you know, we, we wouldn't be here talking about it because there may be a solution. There's multiple potential solutions, but there's unintended consequences with each one. And so we really have to think through it. And I think, you know, I, I appreciate your perspective, Brian, on uh, harping on the education because I see it as truly starting with educating and understanding the problem truly before we can jump to conclusions because this is really at this point all about survival and essentially race to the bottom, which you know, the last thing I want to say is when we have this kind of race to the bottom for survival and there's no standards in place, that means there's no safeguards. So we're in a bottomless pit right now. And that's what we've got to dig ourselves out by educating ourselves to come around for the problems to the solution. So back to you, Bethany. 
Yeah, thanks for adding that. Um, briefly, um, Yasha and Nikki, from the laboratory perspective, I just want to quickly cover some of the methods that are used in labs. I've been hearing phrases like dry labbing and peak shaving, which I'm not a laboratory person. So can you put some context to that, please? You Yasha. Go ahead. Yasha first. Uh, I was going to say Nikki first. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll start with one. Uh, so, so there's a bunch of ways. And uh, just before I, I say the uh, maybe a few ways, a uh, cultivator comes to a laboratory and says, I need better results or we're leaving. And the laboratory needs to make a decision. Do we start cheating or do we lay off our peers and downsize? That, that, that's the actual decision that lots of labs have to take. And in order to set up a lab, it's not... Anyone that can set up a lab can also manipulate results. If you can get accurate results, manipulating results is just as easy. And so what we, uh, multiple labs have been closed across the country for dry labbing, which is just writing in whatever result you want. And that's relatively easy to catch because people are really bad at generating random numbers. And when someone types in numbers, they type in, let's say the number four, much more often than would appear randomly. So they've been caught that way. Another common way that there is uh, manipulation is testing into compliance. This is you get samples and you test them for microbiome and it fails. Let's run it again. Let's take a sample from here, from here, from here. Keep running the sample until you get the past result. Okay, you got a pass. Let's send that in. Um, I can keep going down the list, but Nikki, if you want to jump in. Sure. And, and those are definitely some big ones. Um, some of that has been removed, at least in Nevada with the regulations. I know, um, you know, our, our regulatory agency here is pretty strict and on top of that, and they're seeing those patterns. And I think that was the problem in the beginning of this industry is, you know, the people who were doing these inspections or there was no one doing them, didn't know what data to look for when they were inspecting the laboratories. So people were getting away with that more because all you have to do is look at the instruments data that's stored in it and know if it compares properly to the data they're reporting right but um yeah so uh dry dry labbing is a big one i know several people have gotten closed before um in nevada before the regulators kind of picked up on what was going on um but yeah so it, it's it, unfortunately it's it's pretty easy right now in the industry most states especially the newer states that are just getting started um to to manipulate those results, you know, and, and, and the growers are going to look for it. And I get it, you know, the growers are going to go where they have to go to make their money too. So we're just creating an industry that's pretty volatile and cutthroat by allowing these processes and setting those standards, you know? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I've been to labs, not only Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Oklahoma, and I, there's, there's only two labs in all of New Mexico, two. One of them believes in failing people for microbials and aspergillus, like just runs the test, does whatever the test says, that's what they get. The other lab does not even believe in microbial microbials. She 100% will tell you that microbials are not bad for you to smoke. They're, they don't, they don't harm you. I sat in her, I sat in the office for, I thought she was going to kick me out of her office within the first 10 to 15 minutes. Cause we started getting in an argument about it. We finally become. <laughs> became buddies, became buddies. My wife and I were there for almost two and a half hours. And on, on her desk was, a, was, a, was a sticky tab that said, if I would have tested it three more times, I could have got, I could have got that company to pass. See, and that bothers me a lot. That's, that's said a lot in the industry. It's like, oh, multiple tests, right? Well, there's a line between that, between testing multiple times to get the result you want or testing replicates to confirm your mm -hmm. result. And, and people need to be educated. Once again, we come back to that education, right? Um, if you see multiple tests and multiple result results in laboratory data, that's not always a bad thing. It's It depends on what they're looking for and why they're doing those multiple tests. Because it is standard practice in any type type of, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm getting over a cold, uh, scientific research to do replicates, usually in sets of three to confirm your results. And a good lab or a good scientist would look at those results and say, okay, well, I have this number and I have this number and it's very close. And then I have this number and it's pretty much close. And then take the average because they're within a certain range that's so close together that you can say, okay, we're, we're basically confirming those results. And a good lab will also say, okay, I have this number and it's this, 
this low number and then I have this really high number and then I have somewhere in between, uh, then you should not say, okay, uh, well, let's take the best number. You should say, uh, either my testing's wrong, I'm doing something wrong here. There's an error in the process, you know, and, and then research what's going on there instead of just saying, oh, well, we'll just give the best number. So, you know, yeah, then are done for that reason because contamination does happen. Humor, human error happens when they're pipetting different volumes to do the extractions, you know. So those things uh, need to be looked at on a truly scientific level to get accurate results. But yeah, most people are just testing to get the result they want multiple times. Well, as, as well, too, in New Mexico, they use BioTrack. And, and even if you fail in New Mexico, there is no place to even put it in the BioTrack that the company failed. Like nowhere. So these guys, you know, it's still the wild, wild west. And so a lot of growers, they'll fail. They don't believe it. And so they'll just go ahead and sell it because they're like, oh, there isn't a problem here. You know, I'm about ready to, I, I can't even pay my power bill at the end of the month. And so, you know, they have to sell the product. And then, you know, Oklahoma, I believe June 1st, Yasha probably, you know, speak more on this, but they're going to have what's called lab standardization in Oklahoma starting June 1st. And this is trying to get all the labs to use the exact same type of equipment to have standardization of how they're testing for THC microbials, so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, I spent about almost a week there not too long ago um, and um, I was shocked. I mean, just shocked on people not even caring if they passed, if they, they knew they were going to fail for microbials. And they're literally going into these labs trying to test for high THC numbers because that's the only way they're selling their product to remediation companies. The higher the THC number, the higher number they got for their for their product they were selling. And I was like, hey, I can help you. I can I can decontaminate this product prior to testing. And they didn't even want to listen to me. They're like, oh, well, I sent to this yeah. company. They ruined my they ruined my product with decontamination because they were using like RF. Um, which, you know, you know, ionizing, and ionizing is basically the same thing as a microwave. And I was like, and they're like, it's heating it up, it's decarboxylating it. And I'm like, what are you using? And so, so many people have already gotten so screwed over as growers that they're afraid. They're literally yeah, afraid right. to do, to, to, to even look at something else because whether, you know, they're owned by somebody else and just telling them what to do, especially in Oklahoma, I'm seeing that a lot, or, you know, they've taken in so much money that, you know, they don't, they, they just don't know how they're going to pay their bills. So whatever they can get per pound, they're pushing it. They're pushing it as hard as possible. And there, I mean, talk about lab shopping. That may be one of the worst States is, is Oklahoma. The amount of people yeah. are just going from, shop from place to place, to place, to place, to place. And that's yeah. pushing everything back into the black market again. <laughs> yeah. Um, a few more ways to manipulate results. Uh, what, what ones that are, uh, it's, it's not an oopsie. It's not someone is accidentally improving the results. Uh, just a couple. Uh, one of them is uh, in a lab. Uh, when you're subsampling you have flour, you need to get 100 milligrams of the flour. Uh, you put that into a dish, you weigh it, 100 milligrams, and you get it tested. Um, but if you want to increase the potency by 20%, you could weigh out 120 milligrams, but write that it's only 100. For that, everyone in the lab needs to be aware of what's happening. That, that's kind of an SOP-based approach. Another approach is manipulating the instrument and calibrating the curve in a way that gets you 20% more uh, potency. That, that's also just as easily to do, except only one person in the lab needs to know that that's happening. The person setting that curve once every six months. And uh, that way, a lab can, for six months straight, have 20% higher results. And everyone believes we're doing everything right. Mm. Except for All right, we are about halfway through the hour and I we have a few more questions to jam through. So I'm just going to keep moving things along here. Uh, thanks everybody for those definitions and uh, keeping the baseline clear. Uh, Brian, you know, we were talking about how you're a legacy grower, transitioned from the caregiver medical market to the legal market. And, you know, maybe there were some barriers to entry some ethical challenges during those transitions. Um, wondering if you could share some personal or professional consequences of participating in this lab shopping, essentially consumer fraud and how these experiences impacted your, your health, your mind, your personal life when you're running up against your own ethics and integrity. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it just gave me the goosebumps. I mean, it's it's um, mm. if you're a legacy, <laughs> if you're a legacy grower and and um, don't get the goosebumps thinking about what you just said, um, you probably haven't been through the thick of it and understanding, um, you know, putting your blood, sweat, and tears, whether it's just your own money, your family's money. Or when you were just kicking ass and took money from an investor because they saw you, you know, making well more than 100% profit month after month after month after month. And um, I'm, I'm right there just as guilty as charged as anybody else for cheating. I mean, mm -hmm. when I, not with Green Dragon because we didn't have the rules and regulations, but, you know, in the heydays of owning a dispensary in Aspen, selling grams of live, you know, for $120 a gram or buying. I mean, I was still buying, we had a 25,000 square foot grow, still buying product from Jan Cole from the farm and selling her pounds at 45 to 55, maybe in $60 a gram. I mean, like bonkers numbers that, that, you know, when it's all cash and it's so much money and. I mean, you're just living this dream, never thinking it's going to stop. And then, you know, COVID happens and the market crashes. The state continues to release licenses, letting people, you know, once again, put my hand up, guilty as charged, tear up my grow from a tier one to a tier two going, oh, this is never going to stop. I'm just going to keep producing pound after pound after pound. And, you know, then you see the number slip, you know, $22, $2,500 a pound. And, you know, next thing you know, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, you know, and then you go below $1,000 a pound. You start questioning a lot of things as, as because you're there. If you're a grower and you really care about what you're doing, you're living, eating, sleeping, eat. I mean, everything to do with the grow. So when you start seeing those numbers slide and if you did take money, your power bill is, you know, fifteen thousand or twenty thousand dollars a month. Maybe you got sucked in early on a on a rent agreement, and you're paying twenty five thousand dollars a month for a fifteen thousand square foot building in Denver, which just hosed so many people. And they go back to landlords and screaming, "Help me! Help me! Help me!" And nobody, you know, they don't want to help because you've been feeding you've been feeding the beast too. Like you've been you've been you've been helping. So, I mean, two years ago when I closed my grow down because of because of this you know, had, you know, I don't know, not a lot of employees, five or six employees would bring temps in. And um, when you start seeing yourself not paying your bills, not paying your power bill on time, um, you know, I, I, I went through some, I couldn't sleep at night. I, I literally, um, I got a super serious case of vertigo. My wife and I almost got divorced. I moved out of my house. At one point found myself at the Chatfield Reservoir with my Glock in my lap. And um, it was brutal. And this is what, you know, the state got up to what, almost a thousand grows. And then now we're sitting around 500 and it's going down even further. And <laughs> I mean, there's guys that have committed suicide and I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's, <laughs> it's heavy. And so, yeah. um, you know, I talk to people, I mean, just like me, legacy guys have been in the industry for 10, 15, 20 years and are just like, Brian, what do we do? And I hate to say it. I'm like, bro, shut down. Close your grow. Really that's, appreciate you sharing that, Brian. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, your mental health is really important. Yeah. Wow, that's really powerful. I very much appreciate you sharing that with so you'll us. Cheat, you'll cheat. You'll do whatever you have to do to sell your product. And the guys that are still holding on going, oh, yeah, you know, I'm selling my pounds for six to $800 and, you know, not caring or, you know, selling trim now for $45 a pound or, you know, just making crap other products just to try to stay in the business or, you know, flooding the market with crappy material and products that, you know, the general consumer doesn't know. I mean, Colorado has gone so far away from understanding what good quality cannabis is and what it really means to hold the bar and hold the integrity level where it needs to be that we have left the reservation. Like it's gone, you know, and it's so sad because I mean, cannabis, like 
also saved my life and paid my bills. And no way, no way. You couldn't pay me. You could not pay me money to own a grow. No way, no way, no way. And the guys <laughs> I that are cannot. doing it, I give them a lot of respect. The guys that are really trying their hardest, cutting their costs. I mean, there's companies that have had employees for like 10 plus years and are letting them go because they can't afford it. You know, they just can't do it. And, and you know, great, you know, high on the hog and making tons of money and living life and living that American dream. And then, you know, and then everybody gets greedy. It's what it is. I got greedy too. I'm just to blame. And, you know, and we buy it, you know, buying all the crap and the cars and, you know, the, just the stuff, you know? And I mean, it's just, you don't think it's going to end. And then when it, when it comes all crashing down, I mean, what it could have should. And I wish I had, I wish I had, there's so many things I wish I talked I mean, every single time you talk to a legacy girl, they're like, God, dude, I wish I had a crystal ball, man. Like, I wish I could just go back and downsize and, you know, just work on my brand and work on my product and work on this and work on that. And then, they, but then they're like, but then the state just lets more grows come in and then more stores and more cannabis and more this and more that. And, and it's just, you know, where's it, where's it going to stop? Right. I, I don't know. I don't know, but you're seeing some amazing people leave the market. I mean, at one point I was like, dude, I'd rather sell hot dogs in front of core stadium than deal with this shit. I mean, part <laughs> French, part of my French, but like, I, I just was like, this is, this, this isn't worth your mental health, you know? And yeah, you have to tighten up. You need to know your, you need to know your numbers. You need to know what it costs you per gallon of nutrient. You need to know every single penny. And maybe, you know, that's where we're getting to. And we're getting to people really understanding and not going, oh, well, I just lost a harvest. No big deal. Cause I can make so much money on the next one. And, you know, no big deal and no big deal. And, you know, and, you know, everybody knows what happened in Colorado, you know, 2000, what, 14, 15, 16, when all the growth shut down, when, you know, there was that consolidation. And then, you know, when, when medical, when, you know, medical transition to retail and, you know, and there's always these, these bumps and these hurdles. And I think that's one of the biggest ones we're going through right now is like the, the super tightening up, everybody really understanding, like, man, the heydays are gone. And, you know, what does it mean now to be a cannabis entrepreneur and live your best life still and have a, have, and mentally, you know, mentally deal with it. It's, yeah. it's a big one. It's a big one for a lot of people. Right. Right. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah. Before we move on, um, Yasha and Nikki, would you like to add anything to uh, the idea about, you know, the personal ethics that people run up against when participating in these methods? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think, again, it comes back to the education that we need to change this industry. You know, people are looking at this as a quick cash industry, get in, make their money and get out. And that's where a lot of the ethical mistakes started to come into play too, and the corruption. And now, you know, the industry is becoming more of an established industry. And I think we need to start looking at it as an agricultural industry rather than a quick cash crop. And that, I think that will shift a lot of the corruption. I mean, corruption is going to be there always in any industry, right? But if you look at cannabis, uh, start looking at it as like an agricultural crop and start putting in those same regulations and those same standards of testing for pesticides, testing for microbials, um, the farmers look at their, they always are very protective and make every decision very cost analysis based, you know, where a lot of these mistakes are made on that quick cash thought, you know? So again, it goes back to that corruption and that willingness to do what you have to do to survive because we've set that industry up that way. So we mm -hmm. need to shift the industry into more of a, a, you know, ethically based industry, which agriculture is both <laughs> unethical and ethical, but uh, I think you understand my point is like, it's more structured and more standardized and, you know, uh, the farmers, which would be the cultivators know more of their expectations and they don't question when they send in a test sample for uh, lab results. They, they don't even, most of the time the lab and agricultural companies don't even talk to the lab. They get the results and that's it. There's no questions asked, you know, not that that's exactly right, but it's just a different understanding, you know, of, of, Yep, we have to test for this. Yes, we have to do this. Yes, we need to watch the pesticides we use. Yes, we need to watch the soil we grow in because of heavy metals. All of those things are considered where it's very new to this industry. So we're trying to cut corners to get around it because people don't understand it. 
Yasha. Yeah, it's, um, as I already said, Cultivator comes and says we need higher results or lower fail, uh, failure rates. We have to make that decision. And both of the options are bad. And that, that's the question of ethics is which of the two bad decisions, bad options do you take? Do you start, mm -hmm. you know, manipulating your results or do you lay off your peers? And a lot of labs have closed. A lot of um, most have downsized. And then this is a constant question that has to be answered. But in a lot of labs, there's um, they cannot be dishonest because most of the folks that work for that lab will leave that the day that they realize that there's dishonesty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so if we're going to address this issue, or at least attempt to in this one hour or less webinar, uh, what steps do we believe should be taken to address these issues of lab shopping and consumer fraud? And at what point would we feel there would be enough fixes to the issue that it's no longer a problem? And what does that mean? What's what's really practical here, but not the utopia, Yasha? Um, so as Brian was saying, like, and as Nikki was saying afterwards, like farmers need to take costs into account. Needs to need to be very rigid on how decisions are made. Uh, right now, if there is no uh, disincentive to dishonesty, if there's no risk to uh, defrauding consumers all it is is just making more money then why not do it uh, there are states that are much better than others there are states that have closed down multiple labs from manipulating results there are states that have uh had more recalls than other states those are the states that have better data that have less manipulation and it goes one-on-one -on -one with the disincentive to dishonesty so it's, it's not the 10 years ago rules regulations enforcement policies were set in with, without having any information, but we're 10 years into this industry and we've had 37 different experiments in each different market to see what works, what doesn't. And it's not a, oh, we still don't know, we don't have any information. We have all the information we need to see which states did it right. Make data publicly available so that data nerds can get in there and start loudly chiming the bells and saying, there's fraud happening. Um, do off-the-shelf testing. This checks whether the regulators are, you know, making sure that everything's good. Uh, make the results from off-the-shelf testing public. Um, and do real lab audits. And that means an auditor walks into a lab, uh, both tests two things. One is, can the lab be accurate? So they bring in a sample where they already know what the results should be. Um, and the lab tests that to see, you know, can they get an accurate result? And and also get the lab to, at the same time, test 10 or so samples that they recently reported. Can they at the same time be accurate and get uh, the same results as they got when no one was watching, but they were being paid? Mm. Because if the results don't match, if let's say um, the, the retest doesn't match, then all those products can be recalled and the cultivator would have to take the financial and brand hit for choosing the wrong lab. Then they will have the risk to calculate when making a decision of, do I choose a lab that gives higher potency or an honest one that's not gonna result in recalls? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think there's two, to follow up on that. Um, I agree, yes, that, you know, um, making sure there is integrity in the labs and it's being regulated by the regulators. But I think, there's two big things that would help improve the testing side of things is one standardization, but that standardization has to come after we perfect our methods. There is a wide range of methods because it's a newer plant and well, not a newer plant, a newer heavily tested plant. And we're still figuring out, the scientists are still figuring out the best way to test, right? So before standardizing, we have to get there because what a lot of people are ignoring are things like we're going to get up to 10% difference in results and potency if the sample we're getting is from the top of the plant compared to the bottom or the middle. There's a range in where the sample 
can be taken. And we're throwing all of these uh, plants in a room into one big lot and then dividing it, it's all mixed together. And that can really skew the results of accuracy of what we're testing, right? So uh, we need to overcome some of those things and get more standardized and understand the methods and then collectively use the same methods. And then there can't be any questions of like, well, this lab is doing it this way, so they're gonna get different results. Cause there is truth to that. When you have a different method, you are gonna get different results. Should they be 20, 30% difference? No, but you know, um, I think that's, some of the things that will help some of the inconsistency, some of the urge and open door to corruption, you know? Mm -hmm. Just a, a quick comment there. Uh, by looking at big data, you wouldn't have a cultivator that sends only the top nugs to one lab and only the bottom nugs to another with big enough data sets. No, that's not what I would say. No, I understand. I just, I just want to make sure that um, although there are, it, there is inhomogeneity in the flower, uh, that inhomogeneity shouldn't lead to, on average, different results from labs. It and depends on how it's collected, you know, it depends on each state and whatever. So like my, in my experience, uh, what I've seen is, you know, you're taking a room and, and, and putting it all together, the strains, you know, you have maybe 20 plants of this strain. So then you harvest that and that all goes into one bag and then it's all mixed up. And then you separate it into the lots that we have to pull samples from. During that process, you could grab, you know, you're putting plants all together. You're grabbing this one that was in the corner over here. And this one, it might be different results because of the light exposure, the air exposure, all those different things will affect potency results. And that's proven. So, you know, if you're putting that all into one bag and this lab goes in and they grab whatever the regulations are for that state in about it's 10 grams, 10.5, we usually grab uh, of that bag. You don't know what, what nugs you're going to be grabbing from that so you could be grabbing some that are from the plant in the corner some from in this corner some from the top some from the bottom and that will change the results and it's but not it won't change the average per lab what the, the lab averages that would not affect lab averages as in you wouldn't get one lab that consistently picks flowers that are 10 percent higher than another lab. they don't know yeah, that they don't know but they're just still being sent what they're being sent yes like, it's, it's, I, it's like I agree with both of you the labs usually, well, in Nevada, the labs collect it themselves, but they can't send us. We go and collect it and it has to be completely random, but that's still that mm -hmm. variety of uh, flour that is going to be the nugs, the colas is going to be random. It's not, it's not intentional. They're not consistently trying to send this or that, or we're not grabbing this, but it all gets put in the same bag, you know, so that, and I've seen that uh, many, many times uh, where I can go and I grab from the same bag, I tested this from different labs throughout Nevada, I or, uh, cultivators, I could grab from that same lot, depending on where I grab in the bag, I get slightly different numbers. The method is exactly the same, the same person performing it, the same solvents from the same lot numbers, everything very controlled and you can get different. I completely agree with you, 100%. What I'm yeah, saying so. is you can't consistently always pick the highest ones for one lab and always the lowest for another lab. If you mm -hmm. always get on average much lower at one lab and much higher at another lab, there's differences within the lab. That's not sample selection. Anymore. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm saying to standardize and, and remove some of that misunderstanding because people are going to get confused at those results. So yes, when you could see a pattern, a trend with one lab, absolutely. That's, that's questionable, mm -hmm. but to deny that there are going to be variations is not accurate, right? So we have to remove that because the education, right, is lacking in the public. So they're going to look at that or cultivators that aren't as educated as the scientists on those results and how to interpret the data are going to look at, oh, you, this lab got this and this lab got this and neither one of them are cheating or doing anything wrong. They just got a slightly different sample or have slightly different methods. So those things have to be considered too to remove the corruption and give a fair shot is all I'm saying, you know, Nikki and yes, yeah, it be a been... trend of a lab where they're like you showed in those graphs, there's obviously an issue there. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, jump, my brain goes, I jump in, David. Yeah, I'll give you a sec. Give me 15 seconds here. It, this ties into the importance of the lot, the sampling and understanding what is acceptable variance, right? right. Is it 20%? Is it 30%? Because it's heterogeneous in nature. So is, you know, we have to define what that acceptable variance is because we know it's yeah. not a truly homogenous product. And that's where, you know, the other, until we identify that, we don't know what good is, right? And that's part of the debate, but go to you, Brian. 
Well, you have to put accountability on both sides. And I agree. I agree with Yash and I, you know, and I agree with Nikki as well, too. But like, leave it up to the grower when they say, oh, my product is ready. I really like the way Nevada does it. I would just take, sorry, I would take the lab out of it. And I know it's just more cost, but like who's coming to take the sample. So like that could be manipulated too. And there can be corruption there as well. But I really like the independent sample taker. And I think that is a real quick way in Colorado to have a company show up, take, say, like, if I have the grow, tell me, okay, Brian, how many batches are sitting here? There's 10 batches sitting here. Is it all sitting here? And then we do an accounting of all the product that's sitting there. And then the independent sample taker takes the samples. Now, I mean, the SOP is going to have to be hardcore, mask, hairs, gloves, suit. I mean, like, so there can be no blame game of like, oh, the person that took the sample screwed it up. And my, 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 my. No, like, you know, this, this, this hardcore sample is going to have to be taken. Now the sample is taken, almost put into like a bank, like a plastic thing with an anti-taper deal on it. Fine, the, 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 the grower can still decide who the sample goes to. Now we get to the fun part. It goes to the lab. Part of the reason this crap continues to happen is the consumer is not being educated when there is a failure. So if that product is failing, it can now go back to the grower and the grower can then decide to send it off to decontamination. It's then decontaminated. Those samples are then sent back to di two different grows. Those samples are then rerun. If it passes, boom, the product can be sold. But the consumer doesn't know that it failed. They have they they could they could take their time and get into metric and go through all the numbers and see, you know, and do their education. But it's like they're not going to do that. So why not add an extra step and throw a little this failed on the on the sample that the got that went to the consumer? I mean, the consumer would be like, what? I'm not buying those apples from from Whole Foods because they failed to pre-decontaminate. They failed the step and, it, and this failed. And then it went through some like washing period. And then, oh, now I can eat these apples. Like, I mean, where does the consumer, where are they told? Where do they, you know, I mean, there could be some bud that just looks absolutely amazing. Fails at 100,000 CFU. Do you want to necessarily smoke that even though it went through a decontamination step? I don't know. That's up to the consumer. But tell the consumer, tell mm -hmm. them that it failed. You know, I mean, they don't know. There's so much hidden stuff that the consumer doesn't know that, I mean, like Yasha said, the, like it has to be presented. The, 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 the data is there. They need, it needs to be given to the public. I mean, look, what was it? What, what year was it when Western went around and tested all the stuff in Denver? And was it like 90% of everything failed? Now, great. We don't know it was a deli style and how many people touched it, but still, that was a considerable amount of people that still failed. Did the general public really pay attention to that? Yeah, there was a little, you know, blip in the, you know, and uh, people started talking about it and, you know, whatever. But like, you know, the consumer, they just want to know at the end of the day, they're getting the best product possible, whether that's a consumable or a smokable, that they're putting the best product into their body and they just don't know. So if the, if a failure is there, and I'm sure there's some growers that are going to be like, oh, I can't believe Brian just said that. But I really like the independent sample takers that will go in, see the entire batch that's there, take the amount of grams they need to take, put it in a jar, put a tamper-proof seal over on it. It goes to the lab. But now the ethical come, thing comes to the lab. If they fail, that needs to be, you know, something needs to potentially be put there that says this product failed. So the consumer can know what, what is going on. Cause I now listening to like Yasha and, you know, I mean, it's not just the grower that's cheating here. It's not, you know, we have two different sides here. We have two different, you know, and you think of a lab, you're like, Oh, this is so ethical. And these people are following all the rules. It's, it's just as bad. So, you know, where, how do, how can we keep everybody accountable? Take the separate samples, show the fail, show it, make the lab have to immediately put something on there and they have to put something on the container or the prepack or, you know, whatever this failed. It's going to make a lot of people think of whether or not they want to smoke that or not. Interesting. Yeah. We only have four minutes left here to wrap up the webinar. Uh, we received over 30 questions from registrants and Q and a here. And I, Unfortunately, don't think we'll be able to address them before the hour's out. 
Um, but let's just kind of close out here these last three minutes. Um, let's talk about the future outlook and some closing remarks here. Um, do we see any signs of progress or improvement in combating lab shopping? What does the future hold? And any final thoughts or messages you'd like to share with the audience regarding the importance of addressing lab shopping practices in the cannabis industry. Uh, you wanna take 30 seconds, Brian? Yeah, the consumers just need to wake up and the education and Yasha is 100% correct. The data has to be given to the consumer because at the end of the day, the consumer who's, is who really at the end of the day controls the market. And if the consumer knows they're getting like quality product that they can either you know, consume or smoke, um, I think they're really going to be loud with their voice on, you know, what is acceptable. And, you know, and I think the state, the medical marijuana division needs to really take a hard look at this and, and be like, at the end of the day, it's the consumer. It's not the it's not the tax dollars. Yeah, great. The tax dollars are great. You know, we all question where they go. But like, you know, we want to make sure what's given to the general consumer is 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 right. And, and how we make those steps. I think everybody make great points. Um, I think as as a grower and as somebody that's spending their time for quality, consistency, what they're spending on their brand, at the end of the day, man, we want it to be right. They want to know that their hard work is all for a reason and that we we don't want other and somebody else down the street cheating. We If there can be a consistency, let's have the consistency. Let's get everybody, let's try to get it to the same page as fast as possible. I mean, what, we've had 24 years since 2000? I mean... Like, I think, I think we can, I think we can get there quicker. Um, I just think it comes down to the state too. And the, you know, the legislative and, you know, the people that are pushing certain agendas within, within the marketplace. And, you know, I, and I get some of the things we're talking about are going to push people out of business and it's going to be hard to, to do the right thing. But man, if you want to sleep at night and you want to make the right choices, you're going to do everything in your power to, to, to be an ethical person and an ethical grower and the, and the, the labs need to do the exact same thing. Thank you, Brian. Yasha, I think you're 30 seconds here. Yeah, so uh, Brian, I slightly disagree with, of course, more consumer education is great, but we we can't stay. It's on to the consumer to stand up for themselves and for each individual, the millions of consumers in every state to learn everything they need to know about like what's happening with the testing, which, which testing lab or which brands to trust. Like, I think regulators need to step up and consumers should be able to shop for cannabis the same way they do with every other product and trust that they're safe. And I think that's on regulators, that's on attorney generals. I agree uh, with you. On mobile was watering down their gas by 20%, the same way as potencies inflated by 20%. There would be um, animated dollar signs in their eyes thinking we're about to make a lot of money for all of our citizens. Uh, cannabis consumers are not being protected by regulators, by attorney generals. There are some class action lawsuits that are happening um, but I'm with you on everything that you're saying, Brian. Uh, two states that seem to have the best data, Nevada and Washington State, both of them have closed down a bunch of labs and have taken this seriously. Uh, this is something that um, other states can look to, and they're not the only ones and they're not perfect, but those states that actually roll up their sleeves result in protecting their consumers better. Got about 30 seconds left here. Um... Nikki, would you like to add any final thoughts? Sure. Um, just to like to answer your question, uh, what I see in the future to progress forward in this industry is we'll see the most change when it goes federally legal, right? That's mm -hmm. going to happen when it's just a question of when, not if. And when that happens, I think that will create a lot of changes. And, and speaking to your point, Yasha, we'll start putting some of the more of the heavy regulatory changes in place, um, standardizing things, remove some of that, opens a door to other corruption, right? But the other thing that I think should happen, um, and it might happen when it's federally legal, if you can separate the markets, right, into me medical and recreational side of things, because, you know, consumers that do it recreationally, it's like smoking a cigarette or drinking alcohol. And those regulations are much different than something that needs to be used medically. And I think doing that would help a lot of these issues as well. We, we hold the medical product to a much higher standard, like a pharmaceutical, where we allow this recreational market to exist and coincide with it and have a little bit looser regulations, I think will allow a successful business industry where people can succeed financially and still meet those ethical demands on the other side. So, I mean, just an idea. Yeah. 
Um, thank you all so much. As I mentioned, we received 30 something questions. We will try to put some time aside in the next few days to uh, answer those uh, in, in an email that we'll send out to everyone who registered. So thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Yasha, Brian, and Nikki for sharing your perspectives. And thanks everybody for attending this webinar. This has been really great, really eye-opening. Um, David, would you like to say anything before we wrap? I will just reiterate the thank you. And I would say the solution starts with these types of conversations, right? And let's have regulators involved. Let's have law enforcement involved. We need to share information, share knowledge so that we can start to really understand this and get to the solutions. And I am just so grateful for you guys. This was a heavy one. So thank you. It really was. All right. Thank, thank you, so you everybody. Head to the gmpcollective.com to contact us and have a great rest of your day. Adios. See you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.